pray with thee. Certainly thankful for our common love that we have and the common salvation that Jude spoke about in Jude in verse number three. It's what a blessing to be able to worship together with the saints. We have visitors here as well. If you have your Bible, open it up, please, to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to get started here in just a moment in 1 Peter chapter 5. I hope and pray everyone had a great week. This past week I was in North Carolina for a gospel meeting at the Walnut Street Church of Christ. And there's a lot of great things that are taking place at that congregation. They have three preachers, uh, three elders, and 15 deacons, and about 160 members or so. And we talked about uh, how to stop worrying and start living. And so had a great, great series of lessons there. And it's always a blessing to be able to go to different places and to see the work of God's people and how the work of God is thriving across the United States. There are so many great things that are happening, and uh, it's always a blessing to to be back home here at the West Main Congregation. Well, earlier in April, I was in uh, Seattle at the Kirkland Church of Christ, and uh, Nikki and Josh went went with me on that gospel meeting. They don't get to go as often as uh, as they used to, or as Nikki used to. We had the opportunity to go to Bainbridge Island, uh, which is in Seattle. So Bainbridge Island Uh, I did not know is the birthplace of pickleball, number one, Uh, but there's something else there extremely popular, and that is Sasquatch. You know who Sasquatch is? I think there's like some beef jerky commercials messing with Sasquatch, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Evidently, this is supposedly a large, hairy, human-like creature believed by some people to exist in the Northwest and also Western Canada. And it seemly, uh, seems to be closely related to the abominable snowman. <laughs> and another name for it is Bigfoot. And there's, there's magnets and uh, different things like that out there that we were able to see. It was actually really funny to see. But we all know that that is nothing more than a myth. It's something that someone has made up at some point in time. A myth is a traditional or legendary story usually concerning some being or event with or without a determinal basis of fact. Well, the good news is this sermon is not about Sasquatch, all right? We're not going to be talking about that much more. But it is interesting how some stories become really convincing without any evidence, without any basis of fact. What some people can believe to be true in their lives, that also would entail us. This isn't a story or a sermon about that, but I do want to talk about another kind of myth, and I have a hard time saying that word, so I'm not going to say it a lot, but I want to talk about our marriages and how there are certain thoughts or beliefs that people hold onto, even for Christians, that if not careful, will destroy our marriages, can hinder our marriages, and will have a tremendous ripple effect, not for the better but rather for the worse. It's no question that marriage, marriages in America, are a lot of them are falling apart. Not all of them, but a lot of them are. We see divorce even in the Lord's church. And we know that this is a subject that we need to talk a great deal about. Tonight at 5 o'clock, I'm going to talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage and get into some more details regarding that. It's also fascinating how a lot of people spend a lot of time on planning their wedding, they'll spend thousands, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars on their wedding day, and yet may not spend a lot of time after they say I do working on their marriage. Sometimes people have more questions about divorce and remarriage than they do about how can we improve our marriage? How can we improve our marriage? How can we draw closer to one another so that we never have to get to the point of divorce well sometimes there are stories or myths that get in the way of us and if not careful can have a devastating impact in first peter chapter 5 and verse number 8 peter said be of sober spirit be on the alert be on the alert your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour but resist him Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. 
The devil loves divorce. He loves it. But God hates divorce. And we need to know some things about beliefs that are out there that can have a negative impact upon us if not careful. So I want to share with you some, some myths or some thoughts that, that can get in the way of our thinking about our marriages. And young people need to know this as well. One that I want to begin with here, sometimes people say marriage is just a sheet of paper. That's all it is. Well, that, my friend, is a myth. But a lot of people have this kind of view that, you know, marriage is not really a big deal. It's just something kind of trivial with respect to weight or significance. And I know people think this way. They may not always say it like that, but they think this way because they get married and then a couple of months later they get a divorce. We see that sometimes with celebrities and things like that. They get married and then a couple of months later they annul their marriage or a year or two later and just, that's just kind of it. In fact, someone told me a couple of years ago, that's exactly what she told me. Marriage is nothing more than a sheet of paper. As she lives with her boyfriend in the same house. And so it's a shallow view. It's an uneducated view of marriage. But if not careful, this can create problems. If all we think is that marriage is just some kind of document or piece of paper, then we're all going to be in a lot of trouble. The Bible doesn't say that marriage is just a sheet of paper. No, the Bible goes into great detail about the value of marriage, about where marriage started from, where it came from. I want you to read this with me, please. Go back to the beginning. This is a place we're going to be going to quite a bit. Marriage is from God. And we need to remember that marriage is from God. And everything from God indeed is good. We talked about that from our James study this morning. In Genesis 2 and verse 21 so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. Marriage is a joining between a man and a woman. And they shall become one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. No, it's not just a sheet of paper. No, this is something from God. And it's something that is good from God. Marriage is not just some sheet of paper. That's nothing more than a myth. Marriage is a blessing to our societies. We don't often think about that. It's a blessing to society. It's a blessing to churches. Think about elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3. The home is a training ground. Marriage is a blessing from God. And it's a blessing for the husband, the wife, and also the children. It's not just some sheet of paper. It's way bigger than that. In fact, a husband and a wife are joined together. God is the one who does the joining. Look over in Matthew chapter 19. When Jesus is asked a question with respect to divorce in Matthew chapter 19, he's being tested by the Pharisees, but I want you to notice that he emphasizes that it's God who joins husband and wife, or male and female together in marriage. In Matthew 19 and verse 3, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, have you not read? That's part of the problem. Many people are not reading. And another part of the problem sometimes for Christians is that we are reading, but we're like the man that looks in the mirror and then forgets what he looks like. If we're going to have successful marriages, we can't just merely read what the Bible says, but we also have to put it into action. We have to be hearers and doers of the word. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Jesus is quoting the words of Moses. He knew these words. So they are no longer two but one flesh. No, notice what he says here. What therefore God has joined together is not just a sheet of paper. It is God who joins male and female together. And here's how important it really is. He says, let no man separate. That is how important marriage is. It's not just some sheet of paper or just going through some kind of wedding ceremony. Marriage is where the sexual relationship is to be enjoyed. You have passages like Hebrews chapter 13, and you have warnings from a father to a son in Proverbs chapter 5. 
Husbands, fathers, this is something good for us to remember as well as we teach our young men about marriage and the value of marriage and the blessing of marriage. The sexual relationship is a part of marriage. It's not everything, but it's a part of it. And Solomon reminded his son here about the sexual relationship. In Proverbs 5, he says, Drink water from your own cistern, verse 15, and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets... Let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. You see, the sexual relationship is from God. It is good. It is to be enjoyed in marriage. As a loving hind and graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress? This is from God. Marriage is not just some sheet of paper. It is a blessing from God in every way. That's how he has designed it. In fact, it should bring joy to a man and a woman. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, yes, this is under the law of Moses, but there's still a principle here that should help us out about husbands and wives and husbands, even as even how we view our wives. We want to bring joy and happiness to them. And in Deuteronomy 24 and verse 5, the Bible says this, when a man takes a new wife, he shall not go out with the army nor be charged with any duty. He shall be free at home one year and shall give happiness to his wife with whom he has taken. All of this is good things and way bigger than just some sheet of paper. Marriage is not just some sheet of paper. That's nothing more than some kind of myth. This is from God. And we need to make sure that we don't fall into the lie and deception that maybe it's not as big a deal as we think it really is. And that can happen even among the people of God. Beware of that. It's not just some sheet of paper. Another myth that some may think or believe or have is that I married the wrong person. I married the wrong person. This isn't working out, and I married the wrong person. Sometimes people say that they have a soulmate. You ever heard that? Maybe you see it in the movies, that there is some perfect person out there that that is their soulmate. I don't know where that originated from. If you have the details, let me know after the lesson, and I'll add it into my notes the next time I preach this, but I, I, I don't know. But what a lot of people do think and have about this is that, well, if I have a soulmate, then everything's just going to work out fine. I will live happily ever after. That's what happens at Disney. It all works out. And if we have that soulmate, if we find that perfect person, then there's not a lot of work that we even have to do in the marriage. And then for others, it puts them on a path of making a long list that's virtually impossible for anyone to hit, but if they can find that one person who hits all 50 things on that list, they must be their soulmate. And then they have found the one. But until then, <laughs> they haven't found their soulmate. Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about a soulmate in that sense. What the Bible does say, as we saw in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, is that a man and a woman become one flesh. It does say that there's a leaving. It does say that there's a cleaving. It does talk about unity. And the Bible does talk about marriage. In Ephesians chapter 5, will you turn over there in Ephesians chapter 5? In fact, the Bible says a great deal about marriage and about how we are to act in our marriages. In Ephesians chapter 5, there are instructions not just for the women, but also for the men. In Ephesians chapter 5, in these instructions, we need to be hearers and doers of the word. In Ephesians 5 and verse 22, wives, Paul says, you be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. So wives, you have a responsibility to your husband, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the word, of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Husbands, here are our directions. Love your wives. How? Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. He tells us exactly how to love our wives. Husbands ought also to love their own wives, verse 28, as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as christ also does 
the church. You see, the Bible doesn't talk about a soulmate or that perfect person out there, but it does provide us with a lot of details about how we are to conduct ourselves in marriage. I like what one preacher said about this idea of a soulmate. You know, this some believe that there's a soulmate in the world, and one person said this, and instead of finding the right person, we need to focus on being the right person. We, we often want to find that perfect person. But we need to also make sure that we are the right person, that we're acting in the way that God expects me and you to act. That will change everything in our marriages. Marriage is so important that we should constantly seek to elevate our standards in our marriages. Would you agree with that? We seek to elevate ourselves in our work, in our careers. We buy bigger homes, better cabinets, granite, bigger garages. We elevate our wardrobe. We try to elevate things in our lives, the cars that we drive. So why not elevate even our marriages and our standards in our marriages? This is an exercise that husbands and wives can do and, and should be doing. And here are some things that maybe we can start working on today if you so like to, as we think about saving our marriages, preserving our marriages, strengthening our marriages. What if we avoided nagging and complaining for a week? So, you know, I'm just going to elevate my game with avoiding nagging and complaining. And by the way, sarcasm is often a disguise for complaining too. But what if we say, I'm just going to elevate the way that I treat my spouse? That's the person that we're supposed to be. And what if we understand this point here, that knowing that what we do every day matters more than what we do occasionally. If we're tearing down our wife all year, and then get her a card and flowers on her anniversary, how's that going to work out? <laughs> Will it just erase all the things that we did? If you beat down your husband and never uplift him or encourage him or say kind things to him, and then expect one night or one date just to change everything, that's, that's not going to work like that. What has a greater impact is what we do on a more consistent basis. Valentine's Day is a made-up holiday. And we think that is the cure-all for marriages. Oh, no. So we need to start doing things more on a consistent basis. So what if we started working on things like that, where we avoid nagging and complaining, and knowing that what I do today and tomorrow, how I speak to my wife today, how you speak to your wife and your husband today, will, have a, will go a long way in our marriages. And what if we gave proofs of love? If we say that we love our spouse, but all we're saying is that we love our spouse, and we only feel a certain way in our heart, but we never demonstrate it, then our marriages are going to suffer. We know that to be true, don't we? When somebody keeps saying, I love you, but their actions are screaming something totally different. We need to give these proofs of love the idea that there's a perfect person out there is just a myth but that can deceive us that can deceive us if not careful i just married the wrong person i i don't i don't think he's my soulmate no that's a myth you see what the bible tells us to do is that we're gonna have to put effort and work into this it's a relationship it's a covenant it's not a sheet of paper it's not something we just quickly dismiss it takes a lot of work and patience and time. And I'm not saying that personalities are not important. They're very important. I'm not saying that likes and attractions, physical attractions are not important. Those are all important things. But what's more important, what's more important is that a husband and a wife both decide, I'm going to be fully devoted to Jesus. If we both decide that, then that marriage is going to be great. And it won't be this quote-unquote because I found the perfect, or the, my soulmate. That's a myth. What truth is, is Ephesians 5. That's truth. Here's another myth that we need to be aware of. 
And sometimes people get to this point, even Christians, divorce will make me happy. I'm just going to get a divorce because I'm not happy. But if I get the divorce, or when I get the divorce, it will make me really, really happy. There's a big push for happiness today. I like the idea and the reality of being happy, don't you? I mean, come on, let's face it. We all want to be happy. And we can be happy and we can be holy. You know, one of the things that's making me really happy, I'm starting to sing in the morning time, just by myself right now, but I'm starting to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And there's a song that I'm singing that makes me really happy. I think it's, uh, I'm happy today, oh yes, I'm happy today with what Jesus has done. He's taken my sins away. And as I sing, I do become more happy. As I sing to God, I become even more happy. But happiness is not the end all of what we go after every day. Sister here has reminded me that the fruit of the Spirit is not happiness, but it's joy. And certainly our joy in God and being filled with joy with who we are, where we're headed, what Jesus has done for us, will naturally make us happy as well. Happiness is something that a lot of people go after. And yet sadly, many couples, when they hit the rough patch in their marriage, for some that could come a year, or five years, or ten, or twenty years, they hit the rough patch in their marriage. They start thinking about divorce. Maybe they don't even verbalize it, but they're, they're pondering it. Or maybe they see other people around them and say, you know, I'm a lot more compatible with, I think I would be more compatible with her or with him. And then at times, marriages and disputes and arguments get to a point where the divorce, the D word, it comes up. It's used as a threat. Well, if you don't change, I'm going to divorce you. Or maybe we should just go ahead and get that divorce. It's a power move. And yet the Bible reminds us that there's only one reason for divorce. In Matthew chapter 19, will you turn over there please? There's only one reason for divorce. This is what Jesus teaches. He also said it's a hard saying, but nonetheless it's the true saying. The myth is that we can divorce for any reason. The myth is that, well, I'm not happy. God wants me to be happy. Therefore, I will get a divorce. That is a myth. Jesus, when he gets to the subject of divorce, as he started talking about earlier in Matthew chapter 19, he says in verse 8, because they asked him, then why did God give them a certificate of divorce under the law of Moses? In verse 8, he said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it's not been this way. From the beginning, it's not been this way. That's why we've got to read what's said in the beginning. From the beginning, it's not going to be this. It's never supposed to be this way. Under the gospel, under the law of Christ, this is not, that's not the way. Divorce, just for any reason. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality. Some translations say fornication. Some translations say sexual immorality. We'll talk about that tonight. What does that actually entail? What does that actually mean? And marries another woman, commits adultery. So he doesn't say that if I'm not happy, then I can get a divorce. That's not the reason for divorce. He gives us one reason. And we need to guard our hearts against against this myth or idea that divorce will make me happy. Talking to people who have gone through a divorce, not a lot of people are happy. Yes, things can change if it's a lawful divorce. There's a lot of pain and anguish. And yet, sadly, Christians in the body of Christ have divorced for many reasons. Multiple reasons not found in the Word of God. Problems. Or incompatibility. Or maybe we've just grown apart. Financial issues. And isn't it interesting that these are issues that no longer can be resolved with the one who used to be their soulmate? What happened to the soulmate? Well, she's she's no longer my soulmate. That's a myth. Here's the facts. The fact is, God hates divorce. There were men, leaders in the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 2, will you read that with me? Who were treating their wives treacherously. In Malachi chapter 2, God hates divorce. That's the language we see. That's why I said at the beginning, the devil loves divorce. God hates divorce. Because in Malachi chapter 2 and verse number 14, Malachi 2 and verse number 14, 
Actually, look at verse 13. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. Yet you say, so God is saying, here's what you guys are thinking or saying. For what reason? Why is God responding like this to us? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. Let me hit the pause button right there. Many people will never see what happens in your home or my home. People will not see how I speak or how you speak to your spouse. But make no mistake about it, God is witness. And that is something we need to remember. God, he says, has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But not one has done so as a remnant in the spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God hates divorce. And this idea that divorce is going to make us happy Uh, that's a myth and justice will be served on judgment day for many people jesus gives us one reason for divorce that's matthew chapter 19 and even then it doesn't mean that the couple has to get divorced i know plenty of couples who say we're going to work through this i'm going to forgive and we're going to remain as a couple So even though Jesus gives the one reason, it doesn't mean that we always have to act upon and say, I'm going to go down that path. But for some, they do, and they have that right in the eyes of God. And even then, there's still going to be a lot of work that has to take place. God knows what's best for us. The question is whether or not we just actually believe that to be true. He does know what's best for us. Divorce adds more problems. It invites more sin into a person's life. It damages children. And it hinders individuals from being future leaders in churches. And it shows the world that maybe the gospel is not as powerful as we say it is. Because if the gospel couldn't help your marriage, then how is it supposed to help my marriage? And if the great sacrifice of Jesus can't help you to forgive and be merciful and pure in heart and love, then how is that going to help me? There are a lot of stories that are out there that are just not simply true. Divorce will make me happy. Talk to someone who's been divorced. Talk to them and talk and let them share some details with you. I think you'll be a little bit surprised. That is a myth. So someone will say, fine, I can't get divorced. Uh, There's only one reason for me to get divorced, but I'm not happy. Here's my reality. Someone may be thinking, well, my situation is hopeless. Certainly didn't marry my soulmate. My situation is hopeless. And there are Christians in pews in this church, and I'm sure in North Carolina and Seattle and all across the U.S. who feel this way at this very moment. My situation is hopeless. It isn't it interesting? There's certain stages in marriages. There's a honeymoon phase when all is perfect. Remember the honeymoon phase? Woo, that was fun, wasn't it? The other person can do no wrong. We talk for hours. We get upset when the conversations end. You can't get enough of that person. We have cute little nicknames. But then another stage hits. Disillusionment creeps in. You know what I'm talking about there? He doesn't put the toilet seat down. That's not rocket science. Her cooking's not the best. Man, he's gaining weight. And she looks different without her makeup on in the morning. He's not as considerate and, as, and, and encouraging as when we first started dating. He doesn't send me the notes or the cards anymore. Now the cute behavior is suddenly very annoying. Will you stop that, please? And there's routines, duties, responsibilities, kids, and money issues. That happens in a lot of families. 
And some wives and husbands say, my, my situation is hopeless. We're not happy. There's certainly no joy here. This doesn't feel like one flesh. Sadly, children are often what's keeping some couples together. Or it could just be pride, because they don't want anyone at the church to see what's actually going on. As a result, there's resentment that builds in. But the reality is, this idea that your situation is hopeless... I think that would still fall under the category as myth. Our situations are not hopeless with God on our side, brethren. But be careful with the chatter, the internal chatter that you have, maybe towards your spouse, or what you tell yourself. Because if you constantly tell yourself this situation is hopeless, that is exactly what's going to happen. It will be a hopeless situation, and bad things will happen as a result. But here's the reality. Let me give you some truth here. There were sisters in Christ in the first century who were in some very challenging situations. They were Christians and they were married to men who were not Christians. There was already suffering happening here. That's a different time in the first century as well with wives and uh, the challenges with, with having a husband like this. And yet Peter, the Apostle Peter, does not say get a divorce. He doesn't say all hope is lost. On the other hand, he's optimistic and he's encouraging, not just to the wife, but he's also going to encourage the men as well. But look at verse 1, in the same way you wives. So right now as he talks about relationships, he is speaking directly to women. So sisters, hear me and hear me well. You wives, be submissive to your own husbands. That's book, chapter, and verse right there. Don't get mad at me. That's what the Holy Spirit says. You have a responsibility to be submissive to your husband. You have that responsibility. You must be submissive to him. So that even if, that even if, remember Barnabas in Galatians chapter 2? Even Barnabas was carried away. And now he uses this language again. Even if, Peter does, if any of them are disobedient to the word. Even if. All hope is not lost. They may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Sisters, you have great influence in your marriage if you so choose to go down that path. You can influence your husband. And yes, he has to take responsibility. We know that. But I just want you to listen to what Peter says here. Even if they are disobedient to the word, you may be able to still win them without a word. How? How you conduct yourself. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, which means that there's another example of the proof of love. It's not just something that we feel on the inside, but it's something that's got to be seen. They're going to see your behavior. Your adornment must not be merely external. Braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the, with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what's right. Sisters, do what's right. Sisters, submit to your husbands. Sisters, have pure Have a pure heart. Respectful behavior. Do what's right without being frightened by any fear. And Peter says, now you husbands in the same way. So so husbands, you're not off the hook either. Live with your wives. Isn't that interesting? He's not telling them to divorce their wives. He says, no, you live with your wife. You live with her. You dwell with her. And he tells us exactly how to live and dwell with your wife, with our wives, with an understanding in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor. We can often see how people love themselves by the way they treat their wives. Some men just don't love themselves because they treat their wives like trash. You're supposed to love your spouse as you nourish and cherish your own body. But he says you honor that woman as a fellow heir of the grace of life. So even our perspective towards our wives, our paradigm is different than the world. We see her as a sister in Christ so that your prayers will not be hindered. Which means that this relationship 
is not just some sheet of paper, but is so important in the eyes of God that he's a witness to it, that he joins a man and woman, and that even prayers can be hindered based upon how we treat one another. So Peter didn't say all is lost or you just don't have any hope. Change can be made. And one of the best ways to start with change is simply to start praying for your spouse. Pray for your spouse. Pray together with your spouse. They still have to make a change, but that's a start that you can do and that I can do, that all of us can do. It's a myth that all is lost. With God, all things are possible. And how we view our marriages and how we view our uh, situations, yeah, this is going to go a long way. But if you believe this, no, it's all lost, it's hopeless, then that's exactly what's going to happen. So as we wrap this up, number one, we need to know that marriage matters. Our marriages at the West Main Congregation, they really do matter. They matter to our children. They matter to the future. They matter to our uh, community as well. And how we view our marriages matter. Don't take your marriage lightly. Don't take your spouse lightly. Know that your children are looking at how you treat their mom, and they're looking at how you treat their dad. And your grandchildren are doing the same thing as well. How we view our marriages, it matters. We need to remember this. Let me just say this, the covenant. We, 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 we said that we're going to do this until death do us part. And when both spouses are seeking to love Jesus with all their heart, situations can and will improve for the better. It may not always be easy, but it can be done. Situations can change for the better. There are many false teachings regarding marriages, which means we need to be on guard to make sure that we don't fall into the trap or the lie of Hollywood or media or social media and even some of our own family members who will push for things that are contrary to the Word of God. we got to be careful with what we believe. Be careful with who you're listening to. Be careful to what you believe and be careful with your own thoughts. Because the biggest person sometimes we lie to is ourselves. That's what James says. We delude ourselves. We deceive ourselves. So be careful with your own thoughts when it comes to your marriage. Marriage has always been a big deal in the eyes of God. It will always be a big deal. It doesn't matter if people say marriage is no longer important. You know the truth. Spot the lies and ignore them. Trust what God says in His Word about marriage when we do that good things will come i like what donnie rader said at the gospel meeting not too long ago here at west main we believe in god but do we believe god so easy to say we believe in god but we need to believe what he says in his word i appreciate your attention this morning let's pray for one another let's pray for all of our marriages and let's understand what's at stake And if you need prayer, then this is an opportunity for you to to come to the front in just a moment and to request for prayer. If your wife comes to the front, if your husband comes to the front, you come up with them as well. Let's be united in all the things that we do. And maybe there's someone here who needs to be saved. Maybe there's someone who's not put on Christ in baptism. You know, there's a myth that's out there that you can say this sinner's prayer and accept Jesus in your heart and you'll be saved. That's a myth. It's not found in the Word of God anywhere. But what is true is what Jesus says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's the truth. Don't believe the myth. Make sure that you're right with God. If you need to obey the gospel, let him have his way with you. And you can do that by submitting to him in obedience and faith. If you're subject to the invitation, come now as we stand and as we sing.